Hi, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yes. yes, doctor. Yes, sir. Thank you. So welcome everybody. I thank you everybody for joining this special webinar. Why do research and how to publish the first paper organized by Hack Overflow Technical Society of the University. As already announced by Karan, my name is Pradeep sir. I am the Director Department of Career Planning and Development and I've got the privilege of delivering this inaugural address and welcoming you. And I hope all of us, all of the audience staying safe at home during this crucial time of combating COVID, equally engaging themselves in numerous academic research activities to prove their knowledge and skills. We, we understand post your engineering, a number of our attendees are going to venture into a new world filled with unknown possibilities. So it's a deciding phase of your lives. And we would love to suggest everybody to dream, to dream big. So coming to the main agenda of the day, research. Research is what? Formalizing curiosity, poking and prying with a purpose to think what no one else has thought. Research is the driving force behind everything. And if you are curious enough, this webinar is, I hope, the perfect opportunity for all of you, including me, to turn this curiosity into a skill. I'll take a minute to talk about the Hack Overflow Technical Society of the University. It has been functioning since 2018, and it is beyond technical. It has organized and managed various events, Google Hash Code, Genesis, Hack 101, and a lot more. They regularly organize webinars, workshops, expert talks, hackathons. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the chief guest of the day, Dr. Paul. So welcome, Dr. Paul, to this much-awaited webinar. Professor Paul has published more than 600 journal articles, primarily in the field of medicine, statistics, and psychology. So pardon me, sir, if I go wrong somewhere. You have published six books, six softwares as well. You have been an ad hoc reviewer for 62 journals and served on four journal editorial boards. Throughout your career, sir, so have focused on the development of optical, optimal data analysis, statistical methods, which explicitly maximize predictive accuracy. So your work and programmatic research culminated the discovery of normatic theory. You are the editor-in-chief and president of Optimal Data Analysis, which is read now in 192 countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us your valuable time and being a part of this webinar, the much-awaited webinar of the university. And before we begin, I would like to take a moment to set some rules for our attendees. We understand you all will have numerous thoughts, numerous questions striking your minds during the webinar. Keep holding your questions and uh, so we we'll like to answer all your questions one by one. And once the moderator announced the house open for questions, you can raise a hand and then they'll give you opportunity to ask questions. Over to you, sir. Namaste. It's a great honor to speak with you. Uh, I owe India a debt, uh, a giant debt. Uh, my, my mother's family was captured by KGB in the first week of World War II in Poland and taken to Siberia. The Poles decided to walk 5,000 miles to India and India offered my family refuge. If it weren't for India, I certainly would not have been here. So it's great to come full circle. Uh, I've never done a Zoom talk, and I've never given a talk to a machine or sitting down. I apologize for that. Um, this is the most important topic that I've ever been asked to speak about, and one which I never even gave a moment of thought to. To me, I knew I wanted to do research when I was six years old, and I met Dr. Patterson at Northwestern. My aunt was an immunologist there. I knew I wanted to get a Nobel Prize at that time. I didn't know in what, but I knew I wanted to be a part of his laboratory. Ultimately, believe it or not, I became a part of his laboratory. It was, it was a miracle. Um, uh, so I have to rely on the notes that I've made in this past week. I've been working pretty much most of this week trying to figure out the answer to uh, why I do research and how do I get my first publication. The, the, the second part of that question is fantastically simple. But the first part is very complicated. I'll send my notes later to Donish. Um, so I'll begin. I began th this by thinking, well, 
why do research is it research is really necessary and I wanted to know what great discoveries have been made without doing research and the first one uh, and there's some good articles on this out there uh, the first one that I came across was quinine a, a feverish Andean men in the 1500s came up across a pond and drank water from a, a pool of water at the base of a cinchona tree it was bitter to his taste, but his fever lifted and he lived to tell about it. And then uh, missionaries uh, later spread the word and this was uh, quinine. Fortunately, there's been a vaccine for malaria invented that's supposedly very effective. The news came out on this two days ago. Uh, then uh, a German physicist, Wilhelm Rentgen, was uh, noticed a, a fluorescent screen nearby would glow when he uh, turned a cathode ray tube on. And he used his hand to try and cover the glow, the, the tube to see, uh, the uh, cathode ray tube to see if the glow would stop. And to his surprise, he saw the bones in his hand. And he put a photographic point plate up there. And that was the world's first x ray. So, but that was not really by accident because he was doing research, engineering research on the cathode ray tube. Um, the uh, the other things were uh, a microwave, a Velcro uh, was actually, a, a, it was a man, man saw, saw uh, seeds uh, when he walked his dog. So that was an accident, but all the rest of them, LSD, penicillin, insulin, vulcanized rubber, Teflon, Vaseline, shatterproof glass. These were discovered by accident by people who were doing research, engineering research, medical research and so forth. Um, the most impressive of them is, uh, was by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, who were scanning the universe uh, using new technology and they heard ambient noise and they didn't know what it is and they did further research on this and that was how the Big Bang was discovered. The explanation underlying the development of space and of time and of energy, of mass, of light, everything from nothing in one Big Bang, they got a Nobel Prize for it. Unfortunately, that accident has been taken and it's impossible to find a more important accident except to find maybe the finger of the of the being that made the big bang um, we need a better telescope for that so um basically most of the inventions that we live with today were not discovered by accident they had to be discovered through a research process so my next question was well how many people in the world do research and so according to a UNESCO 2013 report, and that was the most recent one I was able to find, there were 7.8 million full-time researchers in the world. China was home to more than half of these, which is extraordinary given how, long, how, how shortly they've actually been in modern research techniques. They're an amazing country. Israel had the highest density of researchers in the world, uh, point uh, eight, three percent, almost one percent, and the USA at four percent, and the, uh, at point four percent, and the United Kingdom at point four one percent were the were, were the next. India had point zero one four percent, one one hundredth of that. Hopefully, we'll change that really soon. Um, China, the European Union, Japan, the Russian Federation, and the USA accounted for 72% of the researchers worldwide. India has the power to grow by 100 times quickly. Does research improve the human quality of life? It's actually very difficult to find quality research that addresses this topic. I found one article that was very interesting written by Susan Cousins at Georgia Institute of Technology in 2010. It was published in uh, Health Research Policy and Systems. I will have these notes available for you. She assessed the consequences of research as opposed to the economics of research because economics is funny money and you can't, and there's no accounting for money. But for consequences, we can, we can look at, at statistics that involve the quality of life. She focused on researchers and activities and examined results for professional practice, general education, contributions to knowledge, and health outcomes. 
she concluded that biomedical research has contributed to improved health in the United States. However, other factors such as improvements in food quality and, and water and air and shelter improvements also contributed. But let me point out that all of those things, all of those improvements were not driven by accident. They were driven by engineering research and by uh, bench research. So it's a combination of these researches that are going on in space and time at the same time that integrate and form the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that is what is happening. Um, institutional structures, she concluded, however, which is in other words, corporate greed, um, of, of, of science-based medicine excluded benefits for some groups, including, and it's true today, the poor, the old, the rural, the immigrants, and countries such as India, and continents such as Africa. Interesting, Rob and I found, uh, we worked with Andy, who was director of physicians for social responsibility, and we found, gave us a bunch of data from the South Africans who were liberated after apartheid ended. And, and the, the, those with AIDS were just not functioning well. They were dying rapidly. And, and so we were given the data on, on, on this. And, and what we found using uh, ODA was that there were two vitamins they were missing. I, I don't remember what they were, I'm sorry. But it was two cents a day, I remember that. And then subsequent research found out that we saved with that discovery, five million man years, man, woman years, uh, but it's called man years, pardon the, I'm not responsibility for this English tradition, but, but so I was at a party and I didn't go to parties often. I don't fit in at parties very well. And, uh, and I, was talking, I was introduced to a slightly drunk corporate executive of a, I don't know, some, some sort of company that had to deal with medicines. And, and he, 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 he asked me, who do you think has to pay for those people? I told him, I'm sorry, sir, I'm a professor of medicine. My job is to save lives. If you want to do the opposite, just do the opposite of what we say and they'll drop like flies again. And uh, I was almost fired for that. Uh, this is, uh, this is prevalent in the pharmaceutical and medical. And, uh, it, it, it's uh, not, among, among, not among clinicians. Most clinicians I've met cry when their patients die. They love their patients. And uh, so anyways, um, and yet, and yet despite all of this, for the rich um, in America, according to CDC, two of the top 10 reasons for preventable death of Americans is number one, iatrogenic illness. It's a clever way of saying physician caused mistakes. And um, doc, the wonderful Dr. Webster, the genius Dr. Webster I had the privilege of working with, I, I got to be on the paper where we named this a cascade. Um, you make one mistake, oh no, and then you do another thing, and oh, two mistakes, oh, 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 and then and, and so it, it, it avalanches. You, you come in for a cosmetic surgery and you walk out a quadriplegic. This happens. and. Uh, and the other thing is taking a prescribed medication is one of the top 10. And um, I, my Vita is online, or I think it is. Yes, it is on, in ResearchGate. I, I put a lot of my articles on there, those I can remember to and that I'm not embarrassed of. And, um, and I've been spending 30 years on studying adverse drug reactions and on studying cascades and, and ways to prevent them. And, and uh, my, my uh, wonderful boss, Dr. Charles Bennett, is a world leader in this. And, um, so we're making some progress, but uh, not enough. It'd be great if uh, some Indians could get in on that too, because Indians do produce quite a bit of pharmaceuticals. It's in their best interest. I didn't have plan to say that in my talk. I'm apologizing for anything that's offensive. I never want to be offensive, but I do want to say the truth. So why is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, that's easy to say. There's stakeholder denial. I mean, take a look at the history of smoking in America. How long did these people in the smoking thing deny that smoking caused cancer? And what about titanic adverse drug reactions? Adverse drug reactions that caused, that it affected tons of people. I mean, in huge numbers of people and, and, and amounted to billions and billions of dollars in medical process and, and they were denied. And in fact, they attacked and threatened whistleblowers. In fact, Dr. Bennett's working on a couple articles on that right now. I'm on the, I'm on the panel. And uh, the uh, other thing is the use of conventional statistical methods. Linear models and weak non-parametrics. 
listen, adverse drug reactions aren't that prevalent, but they do happen and in large numbers in an absolute sense, not in a relative sense. But the problem with the linear model is that these are nonlinear phenomena and the linear model, if it's, it's a regression, they're using regressions and regressions go towards the mean or towards the median. And those are the average. They don't pick up the super good cases and the super bad cases. And that's what we're interested in. And so it's inevitable that you cannot do this. And furthermore, even if, 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 even if the relationship is perfect, then the determinant of that goes to zero. You get division by zero. It's, 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 it's absolutely impossible for linear models to capture the extremes. Uh, fraud. There's a lot of fraud. There have been a lot of articles pulled. In fact, last year, there were two articles pulled out of The Lancet for fraud on COVID. Data errors. Data. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> I was one of the people that was helping to found a, 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 a journal called Data Quality. When one of the articles in that first one found that 1.5%, at least 1.5% of the formulas in the spreadsheets used by Fortune 500 companies were wrong. The formulas themselves were wrong. What's the chance that the data were correct? There's no chance that the data were correct. What's the, I don't, I don't wanna get into that anymore. Um, now, my great apologies to people. I love people. This is why I'm saying what I'm saying. One of the other major reasons this happens is ignorant and slothful authors. Authors who refuse to keep up with the current advances in technology of doing research. They learned painfully, as we all have or are, how to do things in school. And, and who wants to stay in school the rest of their lives? Well, I'll tell you who does. The best scientists do. It's it's essential. If you're if you're obsolete, it's obvious. The other is ignorance and slothful reviewers. Now I know some famous people, and what they do is they don't even review the paper; they give it to their graduate students. Okay, they're too busy to do that. And I know other reviewers who just don't even look at the references. <laughs> Amazing, and also don't keep up with what's going on. I mean, it takes a Look, how much time do they de demand from us, right? So, I mean, but, but on the other hand, it's a mission. It's a mission and it affects everything down the road. So, um, and by bad measurement, my favorite example of that is the one that's included in every article dealing with medicine or psychology or economics or anything, male versus female. Let's see, all males are identical to each other. They're clones and all females they're identical to each other. They're clones and they're different. They are different. What kind of a measure is this? Do physicists say, well, you got male electrons and you got female electrons or you got male heat and female heat temperature? This is not a measure. This is garbage. It's worse than garbage. Furthermore, I have shown that using this is, is, is what we call statistically uh, Un, un, unmotivated. For example, if you take a look at the, the prevalence of cancer among blacks and whites for certain things, and it turns out that certain blacks and certain whites have a very low prevalence and some have a very high prevalence. And if you put them together, you say they have a medium prevalence. The answer is, is completely the opposite of the truth for everybody that's involved in the sample. This is the most prevalent attack on all areas of empirical science, except for things that involve quantum mechanics and relativity theory. Those things are not, because they actually have measures and they have real hypotheses and real theories. Everything else, all the soft sciences, is called Simpson's paradox. And what that means is the results that one obtains for the combination of the data points is not representative of any of the constituents in the sample. This is prevalent. It exists every place. And I will show you how to find it later on in the second part of this talk. Ooh. I'm talking quickly, I'm sorry. I wanna get this stuff in. Does research improve the quality of non-human life? Surprisingly, there have been no articles on this that I've been able to find and I looked a lot. However, regarding plant and animal well-being and diversity, it is clear that the sixth mass extinction is well underway and is accelerating. I have a reference for you that I will give to Donish that, that will show you this. Um, air, land, and freshwater 
is under attack. You know, in the, the, the rivers in the US are no longer blue, seen from space, they're brown or green. Um, uh, the, the directors of two Indian fishery uh, uh, organization, management organizations contacted me on ResearchGate to say how much they love photos of me with some of my big cow tunas, these giant tuna, I'm a sponsor too. I mean, very good. Research helps you to catch fish. And, and, and because they said all of these fish in the Indian Ocean are now gone, okay? The Fukushima and the Zane Gray turn, currents are destroying all of the fish except for where I fish, Clarion Island. You gotta go a thousand miles south of the US and a thousand miles into the ocean, water two miles deep with an island there. There, the fish are untainted. The rest of them are radioactive. Um, the, the, the collapse of the holding pond in Brazil, the Brazilian Fukushima destroyed, destroyed a, a, bigger than most countries, a swath of um, the Indian garbage disposal in river rapids, my friends. I've seen this. This is going to have bad, bad, bad implications. Um, Love Canal in the United States, the Flint River in Detroit, where they'll be, um, the Superfund sites, the, the, the recent form in Florida containment pond that was going to unleash a 20 foot high tsunami of radioactive and poisonous water. It's every place. Uh, insects are vanishing, uh, but ticks and spiders are increasing. That's good news, isn't it? Um, I lived in the country where they sprayed insecticides constantly. And if, they, if there was a single weed, they, they'd dump a gallon of, 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 of Roundup on this. And I found an insect, now I've lived all over the country and I've lived in different places. And, and, I, and, and I've seen all kinds of bugs, but this thing I saw was like a devil bug. I don't know what it was. I didn't touch it. I'm not gonna kill it. I don't really, I moved. That's what I did. I got out of that place, okay? Um, destruction of forests in Haiti and Brazil, the US, the Australian fires, depleted and contaminated topsoil, Chernobyl, fracking, uh, corporations reimburse people. Where are they supposed to move? That's the earth, that's our home. How is money gonna help me to deal with that I can't live there? That nobody, that nothing can live there for 100,000 years. What good is this? Global, oh, Chinese farming in Mongolia and Siberia. I was there twice um, trying to uh, get a Fulbright to study bird flu, they, why they didn't die of bird flu, and also trying to teach them mathematical medicine. And um, there are no roads, and they have Siberian tigers all over the place. The astronauts have th three guns, I mean, because they, because they have Siberian tigers where they land, and brown bears like squirrels. And, and, and so, and there are no roads and Russia can't, I mean, it's bigger than the US. They, there's no way, they, they, you, can't, you can't patrol this place. Helicopters don't have the fuel. And so, and so the Chinese being pushed out of their polluted land are now farming in, in Siberia, Mongolia because of the permafrost is melted. Last year, scientists found 20 new animal species that had been extinct for 10,000 years. There's absolutely zero immunity to anything on earth to those viruses, animal viruses, and all these things that are killing us, the things we got going on now right now in India, the tragedy in India is an animal virus. What could go wrong? Global warming, electric cars. This electric car phenomenon made me realize humans are peacocks and corporations are lemmings. Ooh, that Ferrari, oh, I want one. And trust me, I love Ferraris. I mean, I love everything. I don't even have a car. I can't drive, I can't see well enough. Nobody can drive. The roads are falling apart. The people are having road rage. I live on a busy street. These people honk at each other like they wanna kill each other. And it's getting worse and it's getting more crowded and people are getting more obnoxious and cars are treated as disposable. So where are you gonna drive this car? And furthermore, with the criminals and the poverty that's coming, if you're in a big car, it's advertising, hey, take me, I'm, oh, I'm rich, I'm, I, I have servants, this car is worth a million dollars, um, I'm weak, I'm a target. Who's gonna do that? It's ridiculous. And furthermore, corporations are lemmings. Oh, we're going electric, we're going electric. We're going electric. We're going electric. They're afraid they aren't going to make money. That's what it's about. It's, and because, you see, battery recycling, you guys probably know better than I do. Uh, it, recycling is, it, is energy intensive. It takes six to ten times more energy to reclaim metals from recycled batteries than for mining. And plus, what do you do with the stuff that you aren't recycling? It's poison. Where do you put that? How's electricity generated? 
How's that going to help us? How's that going to stop greenhouse gases? How are solar cells? You know, they've been on a 20 year cycle, about 23. And what they're finding out now is 10 times more expensive to recycle a solar panel than it is to dump it. And that's toxic poison. That's going to kill the ground. That's going to kill the water. And well, I won't go to that. I'm going to go on around. And the only thing that makes sense to me is hydrogen. I mean, it's the most prevalent substance in the world, in the universe. And, and, and when you burn it, it creates pure water. <laughs> That's not, but where's the money in that? It's about money. That's what it's about. And that's human greed. I personally subscribe to the motto of the American cowboy. Possessions are like anchors. They tie a person down. If it doesn't fit in your horse, you don't need it. And everybody knows that cowboys can live from the lowest deserts to the high mountains like a king with the stuff off their horse. And I always want it to be an Apache. Apaches can live better with less. And they have long hair. I like long hair. Um, so that's a joke. I, I'm sorry, I make jokes sometimes. So given all of this, is research futile? Absolutely not guys. Many great discoveries were made by theoretical and applied research and engineering. Nobel prizes in chemistry and in physics are the best example. And notice that many of those Nobel prizes in those fields were made for proper measurement of phenomena. One cannot understand phenomena and their consequences and their antecedents unless they are able to measure them, not males and females real measures. Physiology has made tremendous improvements and the practice of medicine as it's called in the United States, when you, know, you have the practice of fixing cars, the practice of building a house. No, it's a, you practice and then you do the thing, but it's the practice of medicine, but again, the top leading causes of death, but still they've made tremendous advances. Economics is interesting, but money is repulsive and it's transient and it's different and it's and people cheat on it and they lie on it. The, the measures of this are very terrible. The theoretical economics is great. My PhD was based on game theory. Love game theory. It's very powerful. Um, why not in math? Why is there no Nobel Prize in math? Well, uh, Nobel caught his wife fooling around with a mathematician. How about that, huh? And so you can only get these lousy math titles. I don't even know what the names of them are. So I'm hoping that I get to work with one of you guys or somebody as part of a Nobel Prize team someday. That's been my ambition my whole life, but I have to be second best at best. And that's great. I don't care if I'm 10th best, I'm last. Um, why discoveries take so long? Well, nature's complex. Accurate measuring is a ubiquitous, incessant problem in all fields, including physics. I've seen astronomers, astrophysicists, who use t-tests to analyze the results of their experiments. <laughs> Talk about the high end and the low end of the spectrum. Researcher Sloth. Einstein said that his first task was reading everything he could find on his, in his area of interest to learn what was known and what was unknown. I chose that same path. It took a long time, it's painful, but I just wanna get something done. Um, researcher impatience. Hurry sickness is the leading cause of heart disease worldwide. I've done research, published it in Hindi and Urdu because I didn't wanna create any friction and um, a number of other languages where we did investigations of people who had heart disease and who about their attitudes about, about, about uh, time. And interestingly, interestingly in India, the people who believed in reincarnation did not have hurry sickness. They figured they'd have another chance. And the people in India who believed in the linear model, sorry, you guys see it, the linear model had heart disease. Now, I, I am helped by thinking, by realizing that, well, I will tell you later on, but uh, that a person can't do it all. You just can't. So I'll do as much as I can, as long as I can. Uh, researcher satisficing. Simon was the first psychologist to win a Nobel Prize at Carnegie Mellon. These economic theories to talk about people trying to optimize this or maximize this is 
it's a farce because what his Nobel Prize was, was the people satisfies. They want to get a satisfactory outcome. And then that's good enough. Okay, so it important. Stakeholder greed. Researchers all want to be king of the hill. The research in COVID now is absolutely insane. Clinicians who have nothing to do with the research nor read the article insist they have to be authors on an article that uses their data. Everybody wants to be a data. Now they are, they say, oh, with anybody with a subscript one, they were the lead guys. And anybody with a subscript two, they were the second lead guys. And the third guys, they were the third lead. What? This has never happened before. This is greed. Why? These articles, I'm not going to say, leave research to researchers, and, but it's become politicized, you see, and, and fantasized. Um, presumably, Mahatma Gandhi, whom my mother had the great honor of listening to in, in India, um, said something, but this has been invalidated. Trump, I don't want to get into that. Um, I tried to find the source in the exact quote, and I used to know it four decades ago, but it's, it's disappeared from me now. Google failed me. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then they say they do it. And then they say they did it first. That's how it goes. Well, this is happening to the stuff I've invented, discovered. I invented, discovered. Was blessed to find. First, it was ignored completely. Then it was dismissed as unethical. Uh, in my online journal, you say the word ethics, you'll see the article. I, I didn't put it in the list of readings. The people didn't even read the first article about it. They claimed that it was unethical because the word optimal means that it's probably finding the best model. Duh, that's what it does. Exactly what it does, which is why it's called that. I didn't call it Yarnold's analysis. I called it what it is. Then it was fought. The very first review of the software only considered computationally impossible and idiotic analyses. The guy took 10 different categories and tried to discriminate them on the basis of a variable that didn't have enough variability to go into 10 different cases. Moronic. Today, they cite odor research as the appropriate methodology and use the word optimal in their articles more and more and more. I mean, several a week now or more. I mean, I'm just relying on what I find and I'm not doing, I have too much to do. And what they do instead is that they use regression, Cox regression and ordinary squares. And instead of, instead of ODA, which is they say is the way to go. They're claiming they're doing it, but they're not. And this is where sloth comes in at the level of the researcher and at the level of the reviewer. I'm looking forward to Indians. Um, trumping this tradition. Given the shortcomings and difficulties, why should a person conduct research? The crux of this talk, the crux of the question. I asked my dear friend, Dr. Fred Bryant, a genius and a, a lovely brother, why about, and he says, and he, because he's, he's a he's well-known mountain climber and uh, walk-ups, 14,000 footers. Let me take a sip of water. Thank you. First, number one, because the mountain is there, it must be explored. Now, let me point out something. None of the traditional statistics that have been used for almost two centuries have an existence proof. They can't. They make distributional assumptions. We assume it's normally distributed. We assume it's this kind of exponential. We assume it's a Poisson distribution. We assume this. We assume this. They don't even have tests for this stuff if it's multivariate. These are assumptions and they're violated all the time. They have to be violated because they don't exist except theoretically. So we published a mathematical existence proof for the exact distribution of p-values of outcomes for ODA. We're the only statistical methodology that has an existence proof the mountain is there. It has to be explored. Number two, because the mountain may be successfully climbed if one has the requisite skills. Fortunately, Oda is very easy to learn. It took me 10 years of really heavy work to figure out what was going on in the traditional paradigm. 
Same as it took Einstein, 10 years. And I wrote the two most popular books on this. I wish I hadn't. I don't even get a royalty. My, my royalty this year is 150 bucks. Thanks. I'll do a lot with that. And that's how much it costs to get a haircut here. You want to ride out and have a haircut? So, no. So, um, nevertheless, um, okay. Because cl three, climbing the mountain represents a personally meaningful challenge. A person cannot do this unless it's meaningful to them, unless you want a challenge, unless you want to find out what you're made of, of what you can do. It's like mountain climber, it's tough. It's not for the weak, it's not for the lazy, it's not for the unprepared. It requires steadfast attention. Four, because this is a fleeting opportunity with the coming of the extinction and with the prevalence of the new animal viruses. Before Egypt, people were mostly hunters and gatherers. The, the Nile flooded every year and this allowed farmers to, to come into being where people were actually able to grow more food than they needed for themselves, which freed up other people to follow other pursuits. But then what happened was that there came abrupt climate change. Now, I don't remember the numbers very well and I didn't have time to look remind I think it was within 10 years and then what happened was the 12 major cities were reduced to two and parents started to eat their children okay it's repulsive but that's what happened and this is coming again number five because one wants to honor one's family and become a member of the human clan of teachers and physicians and prior researchers farmers engineers construction people clergy all as a personal concern paying back what earth has given us, what time has given us, our opportunity. It's important. It's important to become a member of this society and not become a leech upon the society. Joy of preparation. All athletes must work. The greatest athletes work the hardest. One should prepare to run as though you want to win the race. And the race is not against other people, it's against time and it's against yourself. Number seven, the joy of comradeship. As one moves through courses, one begins to recognize the people following the same path. Same thing is true of fishing or any weightlifting, anything. As you ex begin to excel, it's as the crowd is smaller and smaller and they're more familiar. It's true of every venture on earth. One makes friends who help each other. They form a commune, a brother and sisterhood, which sometimes lasts for decades and even for life. And in our graduate school, we didn't have money. So we'd go to the wine and cheese party. My group of six or eight people. And then, and, and we would do things together. We would help each other. We would have parties for each other, not fancy parties. We'd all cook something. We'd all bring our little refreshment for ourselves and so forth. And we'd just hang out, have fun and play backgammon, listen to music, dance, that sort of thing. We went to a concert once where the pretenders were playing and it was full of people. And they were all crammed together like sardines in a can, thousands, tens of thousands of them. And so we didn't have them. We, 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 we were in the out, so we decided we're not going to sit there. We're going to sit on the balcony next to the exit door. And what did we do? We heard the music perfectly. Nobody could see the stage. There were like little tiny ants down there, anyways. But we could dance. We were having a great time. Okay. And and then we were the first to leave. We didn't have to wait in the stupid two-hour-long traffic jam to get out of there. So comradeship, fellows in arms, like a recon team. Joy of discovery, being the first humans to realize a newly discovered truth. When Rob and I found that first distribution, the exact distribution, oh man, we couldn't sleep. It was like, are you kidding me? This is real. I mean, what, let's do it again. And, and we, over and over. Wow, this is unbelievable. And then couldn't sleep for a week. Just had to write it. What if I die? What if somebody else finds it? Have to get this out. Have to get this out. And then having it and sending it to the best journal at that time where more no Nobel Prize in decision sciences and got the review in two weeks saying this paper could have been published in any journal on the earth. Thank you. The joy of discovery. Number nine, 
joy of success in publishing, being remembered in history, history, your children, your relatives, their children will know you were alive, being cited, helping current researchers, obtaining research grants. You don't get rich, but you earn righteous, gainful employment. Okay, it's best that way. Instead of taking money from everybody, you take a little bit of money to help everybody. And mentoring, empowering future discoveries. Without your research, the future does not exist. That is very important to professional researchers. Number 10, the joy of self-actualization, freedom of expression, unconstrained love of a family of like-minded people your colleagues, each following their unique pathways through life. You are the opposite of a lemming. You are yourself, you are unique. Number 11, the joy of helping humanity now and in the future. I felt pretty good about saving those people in South Africa. Number 12, and the most important and the most beautiful of all and the final. The race is never finished. No matter how fast you run or how far, you're never done. Because uh, the best paper I ever reviewed, I was so jealous. I mean, not jealous, but I mean, God, can I please do something like this? It was a mathematical uh, philosophy article. And, 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 and he showed that inside every white box, a white box is a problem that is completely understood. Inside of every box that is made white, there are at least two black boxes waiting to come out. A black box is a problem one doesn't understand. So what this means is the more you know, the less you actually know. Thus the research horizon only expands. We never reach the peak of the mountain, only false summits. Therefore, the meaning of research is in the process. You understand? You don't even have to make the fancy discoveries. You just have to be there. You have to be there in space and time. You have to flow. That's why a person should do research. How to publish your first article. It's exceptionally simple. Method number one, if you're a student, you have to earn an A in a 200 or higher numbered laboratory class. Not lecture class, lecture classes are important, but laboratory class, because you don't know anything about what research is like until you do a laboratory class. You have to, now how do you get an A? Number one, you read the material ahead of time that's assigned, okay? And, and number two, you sit near the center and the front of the class. This has been shown over and over again. There are a myriad of lessons, but I only have about nine minutes left of the 45. I, if my timing on my previous two, if you, I'm gonna keep going. And ask about, when the professor's talking about the stuff that's been covered, then ask about the stuff that you didn't know about or that you needed to know more about. And most important, listen for any material that's not covered in that's not covered in the textbook. Because if a professor goes to the trouble of saying something that's that's new, that's what the professor is into, and that is for sure going to be on the test. That's how you get an A. And if you can get an A in a class doing this, and you like it, and it doesn't cause you pain, too much pain, then you have a talent. Absent any of that, you do not. And move on. It took me 10 years to figure out what I was good at. And my mom and dad asked me, and I, I started college when I was 12. And, 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 and I was in so many areas and I, I just got out of all of them. And they said, is there, are you ever gonna graduate from a college? And I said, I don't know if I am, but I'll tell you what, I'm never gonna be a psychologist. I'm never gonna be a statistician. Lesson, you don't know what you're good at. You have to figure it out. That's your job and nobody else can do it for you. Approach a professor who publishes research in whose class you earned an A. If the professor does not do research, that's not going to help you. You might get a mediocre letter of recommendation. I say it'd be a good letter of recommendation, but mediocre because the guy doesn't carry any weight or the, girl, the person doesn't carry any weight because they don't do any research. You want a research job. You want a research degree, PhD. And so, uh, 
approach that professor, ask to enroll in independent study. Now, if you have classes in graduate school or undergraduate school, independent study, it's a four hour class. I mean, it's four hours and there's, and, and, and it doesn't cost you any more on your thing and, and dig this. And if they don't volunteer anyway, volunteer anyway um, to help in the professor's research. The thing about independent study is if you do your job and if you don't, then you're not gonna be a researcher. But if you do your job, you're, it's an automatic A, automatic. And there are no tests and you get actual experience. And this is, tr this is so crucial because when you're doing actually what it is, you will see, and this is, what, this is why I dropped out of the areas because when I got into research, it was boring. It was absolutely boring. I didn't want to do that. And you will find whether or not you like this. And uh, you get to hang with graduate students and the letter of recommendation that you get for your professor is completely qualitatively different than everybody else's, okay? And you can continue to work with the professor in the future. Uh, collect data. Some of the things you can do if you're just a rank beginner is collect data and enter into a spreadsheet correctly. Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I, did I tell you about the, the S&P 500 corporations had at least one and a half percent? Yes, I told you about that. I'm sorry, my memory is very bad. But yes, so correct data is, I mean, and then to redo analyses over and over, I mean, it gets confusing and repulsive and disgusting. You just don't want to do it. And it's like, how do I know it's correct now? Get it correct from the very beginning, become obsessive. Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan had a man, rest in peace, Dave Klingel. And what he did was, see, they didn't allow anybody to do any project there unless Dave personally checked every single data point. Their, their, their research was extraordinary. They led the world. This man, his job was correcting data. And without him, it would not have been it. It would have been something less. So um, prepare the reference section, proofread, double check everything, be Johnny on the spot. Whenever they need anything, run to do it, volunteer. Wars are won by the guy who passes the ammunition. Johnny on the spot. Ask if your assigned and completed activities qualify you for a minor authorship position on the resulting papers. Don't be bashful. It's your life. You can't be bashful with your life. You have to be bold. Research is bold. If you are a data scientist, you're gold. You can offer to help with data manipulation and illustrations. Can you guys see this? If you can do that and that, join my lab, please. Yeah. Both of these are pathways to funding on grants written by the professor with help from you. You can help to write the grants as I described above. You can get paid to get easy straight A's doing something that will propel you like a rocket into your future. Does that sound like a bad idea? Method number two, and this is the end of my talk. Examine my suggested readings, which I will uh, send to Donish after I correct these notes so that I, I spell phonetically so I don't mispronounce them. As you will see in the literature available in your journals at your academic library or in your personal life or vis-a-vis -vis collaboration with your faculty advisor or your colleagues or friends at school or work, there are easy, important, interesting studies which you can get your own data for. I've published them in my journal on fishing, on, on how, what kind of line, which brand of line to use, on which kind of knot to tie. For one thing, I wanna catch giant fish and not lose them. And for another thing, it opens the door for people to understand these things in real world terms. Everybody knows what a knot is, right? I mean, and everybody knows when line breaks. So these are things, and, and you can find this in, in every aspect of your own life, whatever your hobby or your passions are. And it will make your hobby and passions more interesting and more fulfilling. And you can publish them in the Oda Journal, submit it to me through a message in ResearchGate. And if you do that, you also get CTA software. I, the, mega, the Omega Oda software is already for free. Uh, my recompense to the Lord, my payback to all of the plants and the animals and the people who have helped me in my life 
is that my research is available for free. I don't make a penny off of it. My software is free. My, everything I can do is free. But see, I didn't create my time. I, I, I didn't start my time. I don't know when my time is over. So it's, I, I don't call it my time, but I have, I, whatever time I have left is not available to people who refuse to do their homework, to sloths. No, it's 500 bucks an hour. And if you're willing to pay that, then it's a thousand bucks an hour. So far, nobody pays it, <laughs> which is a blessing. I don't like to do other people's work for them. I like to do work with people. Um, and without CTA software, you can't do novel metrics, which I hope you, I'd be invited to do this other talk, which I really want, which is quantum mechanics for non-Hilbert data. I have invented what, uh, what uh, Planck, uh, 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 you guys won't believe this. It's unbelievable. It's un As a matter of fact, Pranith and I wrote a grant on, uh, using these techniques. And it was, a, it was a small sample, but the, the reviewers said that uh, these methods have to be funded, okay? And we get to do that. And it was a COVID grant. Do you know how many vampires were after that grant? And Pranitha and I are nobodies. People don't respect us. They respect the rich and the powerful. And Pranitha and I work. Pranitha works as hard as I do. And that's why I love him. That's why I wanna work with him. And you can also publish these same articles or similar articles in other DOI journals. I've never been rejected yet, ever, using ODA. Half of my articles were soundly rejected using conventional statistics before I put together seven page rebuttals and then got put on the editorial board because the people were sloths and didn't know what they were talking about. But I don't like to battle. I like to do the battle pr pr producing the report, sending it in, getting back a letter. The last one I just submitted with uh, another, uh, with uh, my, my brilliant friend, uh, um, Nathaniel Jim Rhodes, um, the review was, congratulations, regards, the manuscript is accepted. I like reviews like that. Okay, I believe it's 45 minutes now, isn't it? Ta-da, I'm done. <laughs> oh my God. I have to thank you, I have to say a huge thank you on behalf of the entire team of Hack Overflow Technical Society. And mm -hmm. especially when you said that the more you know, the less you actually know. Wow, that was just so inspirational. And everything you said uh, from that metaphor that you used as the mountain climbers, it's not for the weak, it's not for the lazy. Everything is just so inspirational and everybody enjoyed it. We all were stuck to the screen and it was a joy and a privilege to listen to you. And as you mentioned that this is your very first virtual session. So I think we all should be lucky. We all should count our ourselves lucky that we were a part of it. So thank you for giving us the honors. And now my dear audience, it is time for the Q&A session. Uh, so I'm sure that you all must be having lots of questions. Please post them in the Q&A chat box. And I request Dani 